Well, our journey through BC tonight will cause us to explore a theme that is beautiful, ugly, and complex all at the same time. If you've ever experienced addiction personally or in your family, you know this. If you've ever been in an unhealthy relationship and didn't know where it was going to go next or if it would ever become healthy again, you know this. If you're a person who has come to terms with the idea that you and I are people who will never completely live up to God's standard and without help from Him will never get to live eternally with Him, you know this. This is the nature of deliverance. And so I'm going to give you four very brief statements to give you kind of the framework of this very quickly before we dive into the story tonight, because I think this is a very important context, which is often misunderstood. So let's start here. If you embrace God, if you embrace God, if you have a relationship with God, His promise is deliverance. Now, this means a few things. First of all, it means His promise is not prevention. It means that you and I end up in the same place as everyone else ends up, in the brokenness of this world. But He has a promise of deliverance. It's also worth noting that while God wants a relationship with everyone, not everyone wants a relationship with God. And so while He loves and wants to be loved, He knows you and wants to be known by you, there are some people who reject that or ignore that. And the promise of God is that people who are in a covenant relationship with Him will experience deliverance. The promise is not there for people who are not in a covenant relationship with Him. Second, if you embrace God, you accept responsibility for bringing deliverance, right? We've talked all series long, and we'll continue to, about how the rhythm of life with God in any healthy way is a rhythm of relationship and responsibility. God is our Father. He knows us. He loves us. He wants a relationship with us. And he also has a responsibility that he's given to us. And if you think of God just in terms of the responsibility without the relationship, that's toxic. But if you think of God just in terms of a relationship with no responsibility, that's toxic. And it's very easy to think about deliverance in terms of me being delivered from everything. But if you are a follower of Jesus, and if you're in a covenant with God, then he calls upon you to actually be part of the deliverance to other people in this world. This past week, if you get my weekly email, you know that I was kind of convicted by one of the readings this past week. Wednesday morning, I, I opened up my email that we're all, most all of us are getting, and I read this passage from James, and the passage said this. It said, if you show mercy, God will show you mercy. But if you don't show mercy to others, God will not show mercy to you. And he's essentially saying, I have a relationship with you, and out of that relationship, you have some responsibility. And, and you can't act like we're in a relationship if I show mercy to you, and then you don't pass it on to anyone else. And so I even said in my email, you remember this, I I said, you know what, here's what this means for my day. And one of the things was it means I actually prayed a prayer that morning to say, God, I'm going to ask you to send someone who's in need into my life today so I can live this out, so I can show mercy. And I'm telling you the the honest truth here. I was working on my message, this message Wednesday morning. I always work on my messages at restaurants because I have to be out in public to kind of get a sense of what I should be talking about. It's kind of a weird quirk that I have. I sit at this restaurant. I had bowed my head and I said the prayer that I told you I prayed. And within 30 minutes, there was a guy who walked up to my table at the restaurant, did not walk up to any other tables. And he said, sir, I need a little help with some transportation. Do you have a few dollars to spare? And I thought, does this happen all the time, but I'm just aware of it today? Or is this God answering the prayer that I prayed? So you know what I did? I said, get lost, sir. No help for you. I didn't say that, of course. He wanted a few bucks. I'm like, take five bucks today. I don't want to screw this one up, right? But this is the responsibility. If you've had any blessing in your life at all, to pass on the blessing for help with deliverance for others. Number three, the ultimate result of deliverance is glorious. But the key two words here, the two key words are ultimate result. This is the end, in the very end, and I mean the end of time. The ultimate result of deliverance is glorious. The Bible's promise is that though this is a broken world, one day all things will be put back together, and for those who had a covenant with God, 
Every tear will be wiped from their eye. There'll be no more death or mourning or crying or pain. Ultimately, the result of deliverance is glorious. However, what you and I have to embrace is that until we get to that ultimate place of glorious deliverance, every deliverance we experience in this world is unfinished. I don't know if you've interacted with people who fight through addiction, but relapse is a real thing. And even people who haven't relapsed talk about the battle that it is every day. It's not necessarily glorious. That's actually the very nature of deliverance, which is number four, that the process of deliverance, the actual process of deliverance is always messy, and you should never expect it to be anything else. The story that we're going to see tonight in the the story of BC is a story of deliverance that's extraordinarily messy. Not only is it messy, it's painful. It's painful. It hurts along the way. And this is so important. It's worth it. I want you to have an accurate picture of what deliverance is. It is messy, it is painful, and it is worth it. And so I'm going to pick up the story where we left off last week. If you'll remember, I started in Exodus chapter 1, and the people of Israel were uh, starting to be very oppressed by the new king, the new Pharaoh over Egypt. You may remember that as I was kind of setting up the story, I said there's this scenario where um, the, the king got worried because the, the nation of Israel was growing very quickly, and the population was getting very large. Actually, by this time, the nation of Israel has hundreds of thousands of people in it. And they're now all working in the nation of Egypt, and Pharaoh decides to turn them into slaves, and then he's so concerned that he wants to kill all of the baby boys that are born to Hebrew women. In the midst of this, um, he gives this command to um, certain midwives, but the midwives, the Hebrew midwives, don't follow Pharaoh's command to kill the babies as they're being born. And the Scriptures actually tell us that the reason they didn't kill the babies is because they feared God more than they feared Pharaoh. It's a very healthy way to think about it. I I want you to see just how this conversation goes briefly. It says, the king of Egypt said to the Hebrew midwives, whose names were Shipra and Puha, why have you let the boys live? And the midwives answered Pharaoh, Hebrew women are not like the Egyptian women. They are vigorous and they give birth before the midwives arrive. (laughs) Right? Now I'm thinking, these two ladies are awesome, right? This is fantastic. In fact, it's worth noting here, how many of you know what the name of Pharaoh is that, that the author of Exodus tells us about? Anybody, anybody name who Pharaoh is? Give me his name. No, you can't because the author of Exodus doesn't give it to us. He just keeps calling him king, keeps calling him Pharaoh, never says his name. You know what names the author of Exodus wants to make sure we know? He wants to make sure we know Shipra and Pua. Because this is a story, this is a picture of power. This is the king of Egypt talking to the midwives, the lowest servants of the slave people. And what we see is that Hebrew midwives who fear God more than they fear Pharaoh are part of the heroic deliverance in this story. Don't miss that. They took their responsibility and lived it out. Now, every time I read this passage or someone reads it with me, they always ask the question, Greg, uh, those Hebrew midwives, they didn't exactly tell the truth there. Did you notice that? Like, that's a little white lie that the Hebrew would admit. Does that mean it's okay to tell white lies? Aren't you all thinking that right now? Here's my answer to that. If you're ever in a situation where you come face to face with an egotistical, genocidal king of a country, and the only way... To get out of that situation is to deceive him a little bit. You have my blessing. (laughs) Most of the time, our white lies are not to get someone else out of trouble. It's to get ourselves out of trouble. Don't do that. So, the story kind of progresses, and um, then we come to this passage, one that I referenced last week as well. God heard the, the groaning of the Israelite people, and He remembered His covenant with Abraham and Isaac and with Jacob. So God looked on the Israelites and was concerned about them. Now, don't miss this. I I didn't tell you the story of the covenant six weeks ago. 
because it was just a one and done sort of thing. This whole story of BC leading up to Christ coming is built on the covenant. Do you remember what the covenant was? You'll have a, you'll have a great nation. The Savior of the world is going to come out of your nation. There's going to be a piece of land, a promised land that you'll make your way to. And the scriptures say God remembered this covenant and he was concerned about them. Now, is God concerned about everyone? Yes, he is. But there's something unique about people who are in a covenant with God who now can expect this deliverance. And so God raises up a leader. His name's Moses. And the story that comes next, you should totally read in your own Bible because it's awesome, is the story of the burning bush. And this bush, which literally is on fire but doesn't get consumed, the voice comes out of it. It's the voice of God who who stops Moses. And there's a little conversation about the the calling God has on Moses. This is what the, the Lord says. He says, I have indeed seen the misery of my people in Egypt. I have heard them crying out because of their slave drivers, and I am concerned about their suffering. Was their groaning okay? It was okay to God. And God's now going to show compassion and ultimately deliverance to them through Moses. So I've come down to rescue them from the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of that land into a good and spacious land, a land flowing with milk and honey. Do you remember the covenant we made about this promised land? This is where we're going. We're going to keep that promise. I'm sending you to bring to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. Now, this is the beginning of what's going to be a very long process, and I want you to embrace the idea that deliverance is messy, and it is painful, and ultimately it is worth it. Because way too often, in Christian circles even, you'll get a message from a guy like me or a guy on TV, and it makes it sound like deliverance is always miraculous. It's always instantaneous, that somehow if you really believe in God, you get this happy, clappy Christian life. You can be poor on Monday, but you can be rich on Tuesday. You can be sick on Wednesday, but you can be healed on Thursday, especially if you send a little money in to the preacher. That is not the way deliverance works. In the Scriptures, it's never the way deliverance works. The storyline of deliverance, embrace it. It's going to be painful, it's going to be messy, and it's going to be worth it. It's interesting, in the midst of this conversation of the burning bush with Pharaoh, God then says this to him. He says, The elders of Israel will listen to you. Moses, it's time for you to go lead the nation of Israel. The elders of Israel will listen to you. And Moses answered, what if they do not listen to me? Have you ever had that kind of conversation with God? Where God makes a promise to you, this is the way the world's going to be, and you're like, but what if it's not, God? But what if it's not? And I think it's a very interesting place to be, because when God gives you a promise, He will fulfill it. But this is a tough place, and it's interesting what happens next. Uh, After this little exchange, God says to Moses, what's in your hand? Moses says, I have a staff in my hand. He says, throw it down on the ground. And he throws the staff down on the ground, and it turns into a snake. And then God says to Moses, pick up the snake by the tail. Now, I don't know if any of you have ever handled snakes before. I have not. But as I understand it, If you're going to safely pick up a snake, you never pick it up by the tail. You pick it up right behind the head so that you can control the snake. But God is saying to Moses, pick it up by the tail. Trust me, he says. Trust me. I said the elders will listen to you. I know you're having trouble trusting me. Trust me. He grabs the snake by the tail, turns back into a staff. And he's saying to Moses, and maybe he's saying to you tonight, listen, we're going to start to tread through some deep waters here. And the storyline of this deliverance is not going to be up and to the right. It's not going to be straight up and to the right. And along the way, you're going to need to trust me. And I'll show you along the way that I'm with you and I'm more powerful than anything that you're going to face. But this is going to be a matter of trust all along the way. The scriptures go on. Afterward, Moses and Aaron went to Pharaoh and, they, and said, This is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. Let my people go. Now you can picture that, right? You all picture it with Charles Veston and a staff in his hand. Let my people go. Now, you got to imagine the dramatic scene here. I mean, Moses and Aaron are essentially powerless. They somehow get into the, the presence of Pharaoh, probably by the providence of God, and they are going to tell Pharaoh 
that he should just let these hundreds of thousands of slaves that he has, that his whole economy is built on, say, I'm telling you, let my people go. Surprisingly, Pharaoh does not agree to it. And what he actually does is he doubles down. This is the spot in the story where Pharaoh goes out and he says, hey, we used to give them a little help when they were making those bricks. We'd take some straw to them. Stop taking them the straw. They think they're going to leave? I'll tell you what we're going to do. We're going to make life harder on them. And the moment that life got harder on the people who needed to be delivered, this is a fascinating response. It says this, And they found Moses, this is the Israelites now, found Moses and Aaron waiting to meet them, and they said, this is the Israelites, these are the people of God, may the Lord look on you and judge you. You have made us obnoxious to Pharaoh. Now listen, look at this dynamic just for a moment. Some of you have been in a situation where you're trying to lead someone toward deliverance, and when you tried to lead them toward deliverance, how did they respond to you? They said, who do you think you are? That's what's happening here, right? And some of you have been in the place where you needed deliverance. You needed it. But you didn't really want to sign up for the pain that it was going to take in order to move toward it. And so you decided, the demons you know are the demons you're going to live with. And you're actually going to resist deliverance if it's going to get hard. That's exactly what's happening here. Moses returned to the Lord and said, why, Lord, have you brought me trouble? Have you brought trouble on this people? Is this why you sent me? Ever since I went to Pharaoh to speak in your name, he has brought trouble on this people, and you have not rescued your people at all. God, you said you were going to deliver us. We're now in the middle of deliverance. And you haven't rescued your people at all. Now this resonates with you and me. Because some of you are in a tough marriage right now. And some of you are fighting an addiction. Some of you are hiding and fighting an addiction. And some of you are under financial strain. And some of you, we all have something we need delivered from. And there are places along the way where this is exactly what we do. We look at the midpoint of deliverance, we see no progress, and so we accuse God of being unfaithful. You didn't rescue us at all. This is the very nature of deliverance. Therefore say to the Israelites, I am the Lord, I will bring you out from under the yoke of the Egyptians, I will free you from being slaves to them, and I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and with mighty acts of judgment. God is reminding them He is with them. It goes on. Moses reported this to the Israelites, but they did not listen to him because of their discouragement and harsh labor. Now this is actually the Scriptures acknowledging something here that's just true about human nature is that once you've been oppressed, once you've been beaten down, once you've been in a tough situation long enough, it actually has a real-life effect on your psyche. And what goes on in your psyche is you start to see the dark side of things rather than the light side of things, and you start to experience life through the lenses of discouragement rather than encouragement. What is encouragement? It's not just a nice word that makes somebody feel better. Encouragement is actually me giving you courage me giving you courage that there's a path out, that it's going to be painful and it's going to be messy, but it's going to be worth it. That's what encouragement is. But when you're in a dark place, and some of you are, this whole psyche starts to overwhelm you. And so God starts to demonstrate His power. Moses and Aaron end up back in front of Pharaoh multiple times. This is where we get the ten plagues on Egypt. The first plague is to turn the Nile into blood. This is actually the river where a lot of Hebrew baby boys were thrown and killed. And so turning the Nile into blood is kind of a reminder, a stark reminder of who's really in charge and who can really handle things. The second plague is uh, much more interesting. Let's follow this one for a little while. If you refuse to let them go, this is Moses speaking to Pharaoh, I will send a plague of frogs on your whole country. 
The Nile will teem with frogs. They will come up into your palace and into your bedroom and onto your bed and into the houses of your officials and on your people and into your ovens and into your kneading troughs. Pharaoh, the frogs are going to be everywhere. Everywhere. You're going to want to have a pizza, you're having frog pizza. That's the nature of this. You're going to want to get into bed, the frogs are there. You're going to roll out in your chariot, you're going to squish frogs all over the place. Frogs are everywhere and the frogs come. Actually, this, this, is, this is absolutely fascinating. The, the frogs were something that Pharaoh absolutely hated, as you might imagine, how disruptive this was. And so Moses, well, follow this, Moses said to Pharaoh, I leave to you the honor of setting the time for me to pray for you and your officials and your people that you and your houses may be rid of the frogs, except for those that remain in the Nile. This is Moses. Pharaoh, all right, you get to choose the time. You tell me when to pray, and they'll go away. And one of the most hilarious words in the Bible, tomorrow, Pharaoh says, give me one more night with these frogs, Moses. I've kind of gotten used to them. They, I, I, like, who would say that, right? But people say that kind of stuff all the time. What's Pharaoh saying? He's saying, I'm just going to wait and see if it'll go away. I'm just going to wait and see if it'll go away. This is oftentimes people's approach to the difficulties in their lives. There are a few more plagues that come, and then there's the, the plague of hail. And the hail comes and it destroys all the, the, the crops. This, this actually kind of ironically makes the slave labor not all that helpful anymore because now there's no more crops uh, to bring in. And there's this conversation with Pharaoh and Moses says, then Pharaoh summoned Moses and Aaron. This time, this is Pharaoh speaking, this time I have sinned, he said to them. The Lord is in the right, and I and my people are in the wrong. Pray to the Lord, for we have had enough thunder and hail. I will let you go. You don't have to stay any longer. Seems like Pharaoh's had a change of heart, finally, doesn't it? Pharaoh can acknowledge some things that are wrong about himself. I've sinned, he says. You're right, I'm wrong. Time to let him go. Moses, call off the hail. Moses calls off the hail, and then look what happens. When Pharaoh saw that the rain and hail and thunder had stopped, he sinned again. He and his officials hardened their hearts, so Pharaoh's heart was hard, and he would not let the Israelites go. Well, this is the pattern of Sin and brokenness and addiction, getting caught up in this world. All right, I give, I give, I give. Take the circumstances away from me. You take the circumstances away from me? I don't actually give. I'm going to go back to my old ways. Just this nature of deliverance. And so when he doesn't give, eventually there's enough plagues that we get to the the last plague. It's an ugly plague. And God announces that He is going to, on a single night, go over the whole nation of Egypt and kill the firstborn in every household. There's going to be death and destruction. There's going to be the firstborn the ones who are in line for the leadership of their household, the ones who are in line for the throne, they're going to be killed. The angel of death is going to come over all the nation of Egypt because Pharaoh has refused to relent. And then there's a special message to the Israelites, the people of God who have a covenant with him. And the message is this. Listen, on this night, the angel of death is going to come over the whole region. What you need to do is to be prepared. You should offer your sacrifice to God by the killing of a lamb. And then when you've killed that lamb, take the blood of the lamb and you mark your doorpost with the blood of the lamb. And when the angel of death comes through the nation of Egypt, the angel will pass over every home that's marked with the blood of the lamb. Be ready to leave quickly. Be ready. The blood will be a sign for you on the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over. 
Now, if you know anything about Jewish history or contemporary Jewish life, the festival, the feast that's called the Passover is a really big deal. This is what they're remembering. It is the time that God, because of His covenant relationship with them, used the blood of the Lamb to provide deliverance for a people out from under the oppression. There's all kinds of foreshadowing in this that will lead us to the story of Jesus eventually. But this is the nature of God. Actually, the night before Jesus went to the cross, He gathers with His disciples in the upper room and He celebrates what? The Passover with them. All of this, the whole story of the Old Testament, every work of God, it all eventually points to Jesus. And the storyline, if I could link it there for you and I right now, this is very important is if you're in a covenant relationship with God, the blood of the Lamb brings you deliverance. If you've never explored that, this is the ultimate deliverance that will lead you to something glorious. And I invite you to explore it. What happens is the angel of death comes over the whole nation. And sure enough, The Egyptians wake up the next morning to this unbelievable sight of death because of their rebellion against God. And finally, there is this relenting, and Pharaoh says, get out. The people of Israel are ready. They're about to experience their path to freedom. And very quickly, they've prepared. Everything's gathered up. They're on their way. This is hundreds of thousands of people who are all leaving this country all at once. They're making their way out of the country. There's a celebration. that They're on their way. It is beautiful. It looks like God's leading them to the promised land. And then when they're just a little ways out of town, Pharaoh changes his mind again. He says, you go after those guys. You get them back here. And they start to chase down the people of Israel who are on the path to deliverance. They chase them, they chase them, they chase them. They're right on their tail. The people of Israel, hundreds of thousands of people are making their way through. And they find themselves blocked by the Red Sea. Now all of a sudden the Red Sea is on this side and Pharaoh's men are on this side. And they're coming after them. And you can imagine what the reaction is to Moses all over again. Here it is. Didn't we say to you in Egypt, leave us alone. Let us serve the Egyptians. It would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than to die in the desert. I, you see this, don't you? That the real life story of deliverance is not up and to the right. The real life story of deliverance is two steps forward and one step back, and plenty of times one step forward and two steps back. There's a lot of doubt along the way. There's a lot of places where it doesn't look like it's going to work out. There's a lot of places of accusation. It all, it's always there. But Moses answered the people, do not be afraid. Stand firm and you will see the deliverance the Lord will bring you today. And then God does what only God can do. And he takes the Red Sea and he parts it. So there's a wall of water on each side and dry land in the middle. And one of the most triumphant expressions of God's deliverance, the most triumphant expression of God's deliverance in all the Old Testament, the people of God who have a relationship with God are delivered out of Egypt. Is the story finished? No, we'll have to get to that next week. What's it matter? Here's what matters. You sit here, I think, in one of three places tonight. Some of you are in a place where you need deliverance. And I want to promise you that the work of God in your life is toward deliverance. The message of God is do not give up. Trust me, this is not up and to the right. This is painful and it is messy, but I am faithful and it is worth it. 
Some of you are in a place tonight where you're taking the responsibility as a follower of Jesus to help bring deliverance to someone else. And you probably want to give up. Because they're not responding in the way that you need them to respond. They're doubting you. They might even be working against you. You're pouring yourself into this. It doesn't seem like they're pouring themselves into it at all. I'm telling you, be faithful to this. God is a deliverer. And even when it looks like He is not rescuing you, He is at work for an ultimate rescue. Some of you are in a place tonight where you're not in a relationship with God. You have rejected Him or ignored Him. And I want to invite you to consider what it would look like to embrace a covenant relationship that comes with the blood of a lamb, that acknowledges that you and I cannot save ourselves but that we need a deliverer for our salvation. Let me pray for that right now. Heavenly Father, the identity of deliverer is at your core. And my prayer, God, is that as we interact with it, either needing our deliverance or bringing about deliverance, that we would trust you. We would see the way you have worked and to know that you can work that way again. That we would not need it to be pain-free or mess-free, but we would acknowledge we're working through the brokenness of this world. And God, I do pray for your mighty acts in our lives. Because when you act, it builds our trust in the name of Jesus Christ.